Welcome to Exponential Chats, provided to you by Exponential Ventures. In this week's episode, we'll be talking about the safety of current self-driving technology. Despite the fact that there are very few cars on the road today capable of self-driving in all conditions, most new cars are already incor incorporating some of that technology and soon we'll be trusting our lives to it. My name is Adriano Marcus. I am the co-founder and CEO of Exponential Ventures. And today I have here with me Nathan Martins, Juan Silva, Harley Vicente, Igor Muniz, and Fernando Camargo. Before we start our discussion, let's briefly set the stage here. If you've watched our second episode of Exponential Chats, you'd have learned that not all artificial intelligence is equally smart. For self-driving cars, the industry classifies self-driving capabilities based on six different levels. In level zero, there is zero autonomy and a driver is required to perform all tasks related to driving the vehicle. In level one, the vehicle is still completely controlled by the driver with the addition of features that may assist the driver and improve safety. Some of these features include cruise control, electronic stability, stability control, anti-lock brakes, blind spot detection, forward collision warning, and lane departure warning. In level two, the vehicle is capable of controlling the acceleration and steering, but the driver must remain in control of the vehicle at all times. Adaptive cruise control, automatic emergency braking, self-park, and lane keeping assist are some of the features found in vehicles classified as level two. In level three, the vehicle is capable of perceiving its environment and drive itself around vehicles without requiring the driver to be in control at all times but ready to take control with notice. There are already a few cars on the market with these capabilities, and it is often referred to as highway autopilot and has been made famous by Tesla. In level four, the vehicle is fully capable of driving itself around under most conditions without requiring a driver, while still allowing the driver to take back control of the vehicle if desired. In the last level, level five, the vehicle is fully autonomous and it can drive under all conditions. This is the most advanced level of autonomous driving and the one considered so safe that the presence of a steering wheel and pedals becomes an optional feature in the vehicle. We've been advancing through these levels for years now without noticing how artificial intelligence has been creeping into our driving experience. You would be hard pressed to find new vehicles being produced today that are considered level zero. Most brands are now offering at least level two for most of their models. And most luxurious brands already offer level three capabilities to some of their vehicles. Tesla is the only automaker mass producing vehicles at what seems to be a near, near level four capability. Now that we know how autonomous vehicles are classified, are we supposed to trust our lives to this new technology? How safe can it be? With that in mind, I'd like to hear from Harley on his perspective in, on ways that human drivers are currently better than our state-of-the-art artificial intelligence. Oh, well, hello, everyone. Self-driving cars have most definitely come a long way. That's inevitable, uh, and that's uh, clear to see. They've got sensor, they've got fast processing, and they certainly do certain things way better than we do. But in my opinion, there are certain things that humans just now, at least, uh, just do way better. Let's assume, for example, that a, a self-driving car is driving down a highway and there's an obstacle on the, on the way. It can be a paper bag, a plastic bag from groceries. It can be a rock or a, a multitude of different objects that, given the texture, you might assume it's safe to drive over it or not. A human is most likely to be more, more apt when deciding whether or not it, it's safe or not at all to drive her over that, that obstacle. That's that's a way that, uh, that's one example. Another example that humans will be better is, assuming that you're driving down a highway or a street that doesn't have the, prof the proper traffic signs and divisions on, on the lanes and everything, they haven't been painted in or something along those lines, a human might be able to assume and infer from the city he lives in, from how things are usually done in the traffic in that area of where he can turn or where he can't turn. A self-driving car, on the other hand, might not know at all what to do without these particular infrastructure cues. So that, that's that's how I see it. Well, and you're right. Um, most of these challenges are the ones that keep uh, most automakers still busy trying to figure out how to overcome them. 
There is another challenge actually, which is um, in the beginning, most of these manufacturers, they were training cars out of California. One, one big example was Google. Google was the first one out there with his self-driving Prius. It was famous several years ago for driving up and down the, the Silicon Valley, uh, racking up hours and, and collecting data for training. And um, turns out that once you, you put a vehicle like that in Chicago and it's winter and it's snowing, it doesn't know what to make of all of that whiteness. You cannot handle it. So um, yes, that's, that's one of the issues. And that's why from level four to level five, the only change is from most conditions to all conditions. The ability to drive on any weather, any situation, that's what defines a level five. So if you train your vehicle on dry roads, sunny roads, or even during, during the night, but well-lit roads, you're going to face issues when you're in a situation where the road is not well-lit, and then you end up with accidents such as the one uh, involving the, the Uber uh, self-driving vehicle where they uh, ran over a, a cyclist who was uh, crossing the road at night. Um, both the safety driver and the vehicle failed to identify the, the cyclist. I'm sorry, the cyclist and prevent the accident. So um, there, there are gaps. We're not there yet. Having said that, we are already trusting our lives to AI, aren't we? When it comes to our vehicles. I don't know. Um, from my perspective, from my point of view, um, living in Brazil, um, it really just depends on the country. I mean, not just the country, I mean, the area where you're at, um, and the amount of money people have, like, I can't imagine something like that, um, being part of the day to day he here for a long time, at least, um, mostly because of like the e economics of it, um, with those cars aren't produced here. Um, it'd probably take a long time. Um, for one of the big guys to start. You know that, it. um, remember know. that conversation we had about classifying artificial intelligence and how, um, it has different levels of intelligence. That's why we have different yeah. separate levels for self-driving cars. And uh, yeah, but I mean like th those basic levels, even those are kind of hard for like everyone. Like I drive a car that's over 10 years old. Um, everyone in my family does as well. Like newer cars aren't exactly like a luxury for, you know, everyone but here. What about, no, it's different in the U S what about cruise control? What about, uh, ABS? Don't have it. Just ABS. That's it. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Um, it's, it's hard to expect that all countries, uh, are going to share the same technology. Uh, reality here in the U S right now is that you cannot buy a car that doesn't have those two features. I, I have no idea of any brand that sell them without those two features. And those are considered level one. Uh, if you go buy a Honda, a Hyundai, Toyota, most of them are going to have uh, features that you can add or they're going to come standard that uh, put your vehicle into level two territory with adaptive self, con uh, self uh, cruise control, um, with uh, lane keep assist, emergency braking, those are all features that have been present in the roads, not just of the US, but several other countries for almost 10 years. And we've been trusting that so far. Well, when it comes to that, that, that brings a good point because uh, emergency braking is nothing new at this point. We've seen plenty of it, as you mentioned. And I'd like, I'd say that I would trust a uh, emergency braking more than a human braking in an emergency situation. I'd feel safer uh, knowing that a, a computer will break if needed when it compared to a human. So that, that already proves that self-driving cars in many ways uh, are safe. At least I feel that way about particular specific circumstances such as uh, braking, uh, avoiding a, a, a collision, for example. Yeah, so um, 
this is this is what we're starting to see. So if you're buying new cars and you're willing to put extra money towards those features, you already have access to level two um, automation in your vehicle. Uh, virtually all brands have them. Some brands uh, are trying to bring them to all vehicles as standard security feature. Um, brands that I can think of right now are Subaru and Toyota. Uh, Tesla as well. All vehicles have that standard. You cannot buy a Tesla with those features. Um, but you can, you can buy a Tesla that is not level three, but you cannot buy a Tesla that is under level two. Uh, most luxury vehicles, uh, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, um, all of them offer at least level two for all of their vehicles already. Uh, the, the new ones coming out of the, the production line. So the point being that it's creeping in. It's already available. It's already on the road. It's not self-driving capability, but it's AI driving and interfering with your driving experience for better or worse. Um, I've had the experience of um, owning a vehicle with adaptive cruise control and, and lane keep assist. My current vehicle does not have that, but I've had that for a few years and you get spoiled. It's actually uh, a great feature when you're in a highway trying to commute and it's a, a there's a traffic jam and you're you switch into that uh, move, stop, move, stop pattern, you turn on the adaptive cruise control as long as it has the, the full stop capability. Uh, and you don't have to worry about the vehicle following the vehicle in front of you anymore. Um, if, if you're distracted, it's going to warn you that you're leaving your, your lane. It's going to help you go back to the center of that lane. So those are already very great features that will diminish the amount of accidents. Distracted driving is responsible for over 30% of all the fatal accidents in the United States. And that figure might be different for other countries, but it's right around there. That includes uh, texting, arguing, using the phone, paying attention to other things inside the car, uh, fatigue, all of those things is what we consider uh, distracted driving. And they're responsive for a third of all the fatal accidents in the country, at least. So if you think about it, by just adopting level two in all vehicles, you're already diminishing the number of fatal accidents by a significant number. I actually agree with you. That's very true. It, it kind of raises the question. Uh, I want to draw a parallel here. Airplanes are mostly self-driven in a sense, and they're fairly safe overall. Back, uh, uh, nowadays, it's you could say it's actually a statistics that it's safer to to you're more likely to die from a car accident than an airplane accident. And I would go as far as to say uh, I'm assuming that's mostly because it's all well controlled, everything's planned and, and monitored, all the conditions are properly measured and everything. Uh, w wouldn't that be the same thing for the cars? But what, what that what that means, and that goes along with what I said in the beginning, that maybe it's not the cars that are at fault. The technology might be there for those things. It's just that uh, the infrastructure has to be so precise and so well defined that that's that's where the gap between level four and level five are. Is so in a sense they are safe because they use technologies that are comparable to what planes do. But maybe what it what is not safe is the is the fact that the infrastructure, the cities we live in, are not ready for them to be uh, a potential level five. Do you guys agree with this, Adriano? Yeah. Uh, one other thing that we have to think about uh, while driving, we have a lot of unexpected events that might happen. Uh, for example, animals on the street or anything weird that even though it never happened to you, you from, from your own intelligence, you know what kind of decision to take. 
while when we talk about artificial intelligence, we usually need to, to have some kind of these weird events in the training set, in the data that was used to, to train the, these models. So it's really hard to, to have all these uh, unexpe unexpected events on these data sets. And that's where I think it's very hard to, to go to level five. Because like I said, you are on the middle of the street and suddenly an animal uh, appeared. And let's say that in your data set, there is no um, example of this kind of animal appearing or anything like that. So I think it's something that we might be concerned, the, these unexpected events that might happen in general. Now, the, the, even though uh, I agree with, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have enough variety of data to train for every single possible scenario, at the same time, uh, your AI gets used to what normal means. And when something abnormal happens, it may not be able to deal with it appropriately, but it knows it's abnormal. And if you're using filters, you're not, what I'm talking about, you're not, is that you're not using just cameras, for example. You're using a combination of cameras and sensors, such as LIDARs. Um, now you, you can compound evidence to make a more informed decision. So it's an animal. Never seen that animal before. But LIDAR detects as an obstruction. So the car would naturally just stop. Doesn't need to know the gender, size of the animal, type of the animal. Just needs to know it's an obstruction in the middle of the road. Now you're going to run into cases where uh, uh, you have objects that are okay to go through and they could be perceived as obstructions. Yeah, indeed. And then, and then you have an issue. But then again, uh, Tesla's have been driving around for years now. They're collecting a massive amount of data. And I would suspect that they have a lot of corner cases already documented, captured, that they feed through their training process to improve the capabilities of their self-driving car. Yeah, but uh, another thing, uh, Tesla is running around the United States uh, you spoke a little bit about uh, the difference between Chicago and other places of the United States. When we come to other countries, these differences are even more noted. So, I mean, I, I, I think if uh, the Tesla is running very well in the United States, I, even though it's run, running well, I can imagine it running this, the same way here in Brazil, for example, or China or other countries, because it's a different domain. The, the streets are different, uh, the signs on the streets and everything else. There are different corner cases that should be dealt with. So there are a lot of this kind of, of things that we might be concerned to. Yeah, sure. For example, here in the US, most, most cities in the US, you're allowed to do a left turn when you have a green light or you're allowed to do a right turn when there is a red light. Those things are not allowed in Brazil. And, yeah. and yes, if you have a, if you take a Tesla and you put it in, in, in Brazil, assuming the same traffic patterns and law, disregarding that the traffic signs are going to be completely different, the markings on the ground are, are going to be different, and you just pay attention to those few things that I just told you, it is guaranteed that there are going to be accidents. Either they're going to run over pedestrians that do not expect cars to do a right turn when there is a red light or it's going to hit oncoming traffic because it's not used to do a left turn when there is a green light. And yes, but then again, you, you can do transfer learning for those cases. I, I suspect that for some countries would be harder than others. But for the most part, this is not like having to rewrite your whole solution, changing all your sensors, adjusting everything. It's going to be a softer problem more than anything else. A question for you guys. Uh, would it be safe to assume that the quality of the asphalt, the textures, the humidity of the air, the type of dust that could change the reflections you get off the asphalt and all, 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 all things like this, 
would would that be enough to affect a se an optical sensor that uses computer vision to analyze things? But would those things be enough? Something as simple as the, what they put into the in, into the uh, to the asphalt to make it particularly because that, that, that most def definitely changes from country to country. Do you want to take that one, Igor? Yep. So uh, for sure, that's that seems you difficult. The the artificial intelligence that are, are just doing some kind of maths to to see what are in the environment there. Uh, what I can do is train in more data as possible. So uh, if I have different weathers, different times, uh, sensors, uh, data sensors from the day or from the night, uh, we need to, to cover the, all possibilities. So we can have a more generalized AI. And that's what I think they, they are trying to do to, to handle those cases. That's true. And um, answering more specifically to your question, Arlie, if, if the computer that drives the car relies on stereo cameras, for example, uh, those operate in the same light frequencies that our eyes operate. So we can, they can see what we can see, especially if they're stereo then on top of seeing the same spectrum of light that we observe, they also see in uh, uh, stereo, uh, they have a stereo vision, so they can perceive depth um, and shape a lot better than, than just one camera. So if there is, there is dust, if there is uh, heavy rains, if there is some kind of obstruction that would prevent a human driving from seeing through, then the camera is also prevented from seeing through. Moreover, if you have, for example, a LiDAR, a LiDAR does not rely on exterior light to operate because it projects the light, measures the reflection time, and creates this um, point cloud that you use to map the distance to objects in front and around of you. Um, if it's pitch black, it's dark outside, LiDAR can still see everything around at least calculate the distance, distances and measure distance to obstructions, um, you would have a diminished quality of uh, predictions because now you, do not, you don't have the ability to combine what you're seeing with a camera with what you're measuring with a LiDAR anymore. So perhaps the, the self-driving capability would resort to the driver or would resort to a degraded mode driving more carefully, slower, and uh, making more deliberate decisions when working around obstructions. Um, but uh, as, as, a, as a reference, you have to understand the capabilities of the sensors that you're using and how they operate. Obstructions are definitely going to throw off uh, the LiDAR. If it's, it's too thick of, uh, of a cloud of dust or um, whatever is surrounding the car that you could potentially drive through, but it's just too thick that the light is not gonna find its way back directly to the LiDAR, then LiDAR is not gonna perform as well as expected. And now you end up with a camera that doesn't perceive what's, what it should and a LiDAR that doesn't perceive what it should. But then again, as a human driver, you would be on the same situation. So in that case, I think the car would just stop, come to a stop and say, it's not safe to drive. Not sure if that answers your question combined to what Igor said. It, it does, it explains it. Uh, it. Along with that, questions such as the AI that they use, for example, for Tesla, is trained with using a particular uh, car model with a certain weight distribution. Assuming from what you're saying, generalizing the AI would allow it to to also apply to other cars that are bigger, heavier, or have different weight distributions as well. So uh, pretty much the AI can become ge more generalized. And yes, in a way, if you have a, a plastic bag that looks like it's empty and there's nothing inside, but it's completely filled with concrete, almost like a trap, we will, a human would most likely run over it and, uh, and actually have an accident. So in a sense, the only difference is that the AI car would just say, oh, this, is, this isn't safe. So. Yes, it definitely answers the question. 
Yeah, I think it's it's unreasonable for us to expect that AI is going to be able to cover every single safety issue or potential road hazard. I mean, we can we can sit here and talk about lightning strikes. Those happen. You're driving down a road and and a lightning strikes your vehicle. Are we do we have enough data to train our model to on how to behave in these kinds of situations? I don't think so. I don't think that uh, as you know, this this has have been caught in tape has happened before, um, and I'm assuming happened a lot more than uh, the instances where it was caught on tape. But it's hard to think that Teslas have gone through this enough to add to their training. Moreover, if you add that to the training, what can be done other than just stopping the car? And if the car is not fried from the uh, incident, uh, what would be the, the best course of action? It's hard. Humans would not know how to behave appropriately. There is no single right answer to this kind of condition. So expecting that AI is going to be this divine superpower um, knowing everything and behaving perfectly around everything, it's, it's not going to happen. It's unreasonable. Let me, let me try uh, a question as well. Um, you guys all mentioned like safety from a natural world kind of perspective. I want to try looking at it from a software perspective as well, because when you have something like a Tesla or a self-driving car, which receives updates, which is connected to the internet, um, wouldn't this also be a problem in terms of like our privacy? Like the same sensors that are used to look outside are the same sensors that are like, we don't have privacy in the car anymore. And we also don't have control over the software that we want. Like, I know most of us are devs here. We, we mostly don't use Windows. But, like, when you're doing something important and Windows like, hey, I'm just going to update whatever you do you, and then you're there staring at your computer. Um, I've seen a couple of Reddit posts of people who were stuck with their uh, car updating, and they needed to do things. Um, so in terms of, like, the software, what are your thoughts? Well, um, I'll take this. Um yeah, absolutely. Teslas, they do have uh, what they call over-the-air updates. And whenever you have an update, you incur the risk of failure. And if there is a failure uh, updating your firmware, likelihood is that your car is not going to operate the same until you take it to a dealer and have it fixed. Um, yeah, that's expected to happen. That happens with phones. That happens with video games, whenever you're installing an update, you incur that risk. Now, I'm assuming that Tesla is smart enough to send those updates when the car owner is probably sleeping and those updates are safe and quick enough that you wouldn't disrupt the owner's ability to jump in the car in short notice and drive away uh, if they have a sudden need to drive to the hospital or, or get out of the house. It can happen with uh, non-self-driving vehicles too. If you think about it, your vehicle can just stop working overnight, ran out of battery. I can in a sense. I agree with you there. Um, what about like the other part that I mentioned, like in terms of that kind of privacy? Um, do you think that safety and privacy have something to do with one another or that's a whole nother subject? I think, um, yes, safety and privacy, they are related, uh, not, they don't overlap completely, but if you think about, uh, securing access to your computer Securing access to your car is going to be even more important. Because, like, I, uh, what comes to mind is that incident with I think it was the Ring cameras or something like that, where the hacker got into the cameras and was talking to the to the daughter of the family, was scaring her, was making weird noises. It was a if baby monitor. Yeah, if something like that happened, someone got access to your car, like locked you in your car, 
and that kind of stuff. That, that could be pretty scary. So that can happen and happen already. So as long as you're level two, meaning that your car is capable of controlling acceleration and steering through software, you're already vulnerable for, to that kind of attack. And there are many, many demonstrations of uh, hacking events uh, in which you gain control of the car and you can brake it, you can accelerate, you can steer the vehicle. If it does have a camera, you can stream the camera. Um, that is a risk right now. We don't need to wait for self-driving cars to, to face this kind of situation. Well, but well, when it comes to things like this, let's say a hacker gets access to the car and controls the acce its acceleration and drives you off a cliff, su supposedly. Uh, that that technically, yeah, it's possible. And as you said, it happened already. However, I think it would be fairly easy for Tesla to build fail safes, where given a particular situation, you can override the system and gain manual control over the steering and acceleration. And in a similar sense, you can override and get access to unlocking the door in a manual way. I think those basic things that control your 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 your, your physical position, where you are, and how fast you're going, could there could be a fail safe for those particular things, I believe. Yeah, That's like a fail safe. A all. fail safe would be good if you have time to act with it. Like, imagine you're on the freeway going like 60, 80 miles an hour, and somebody just takes control of the steering wheel for like three seconds and then just jerks it. You're gone. You can't do anything. True. Actually, you're right. And it's it's a game of cat and mouse. You can't you can't really win this kind of game. If we could, then why is it that we don't have um, you know fail safers? Uh, fail safes for servers. Well, how come that there is still people managing to hack into high profile systems? Uh, if you have a fail safe, then I can probably control that fail safe once I get into your system. If, if there are um, uh, monitoring systems, I can perhaps overwhelm or overcome the monitoring system, or I can trick into thinking that this is perfectly normal behavior. So there are many ways that you can hack into a system we always think of the obvious one, same way that when we think about um, a criminal attack, we think of the guy just, you know, warning himself 100 meters uh, from you saying, this, this, this is an assault, give me everything you have, and you have all the time to respond to that. That is not true. Sometimes you can see a threat coming, but most often, especially when it comes to those kinds of invasions, you cannot. And that is exactly because they try to cover their tracks. They, they try to be stealth about their invasion. So I think, I think it's, it, you know, it's both a privacy and a safety issue when it comes to cyber attacks to a self-driving car, because first, you can have instances of cyber, cyber attacks in which the sole purpose is not to harm you, but to get information about your home. So perhaps your, your car has control over the garage door. So you hack into that car, get the code for the garage door, and now you can get inside the house. Or I want to know where you've been driving. Or I want to get details about your personal accounts. So when you when you get into your car and sync with your phone, everything syncs with the car, your, your contact list. You can read your email. You can read your messages. So you might want to... Uh, hacking to a self-driving car or even a normal car. Today, we already sync with our phones, uh, especially if you have uh, CarPlay. Um, and, and you do that just in order to access the kind of data that is shared with the, the, the car. Um, and then there is safety, which is, OK, so now we have, a, a, I don't know, a coordinated terrorist attack in which they, they randomly select a uh, sample of vehicles every day and have them crash randomly. How do you deal with that? W what, what kind of terror are you going to cause to people who have level two capabilities today by those kinds of attacks? And granted, the range to conduct those attacks is, is small. So you can't, you can't conduct an attack uh, like this if you're far away from the vehicle. But... It's conceivable that with enough effort, you'd be able to create many, many accidents by uh, 
tracking down vehicles with certain vulner vulnerabilities and cause them to crash randomly. This also could be like um, not just applying to terrorism, but when we look at nation states like Russia or um, other nation states that are known for going after individuals, um, if someone gets into a car like that and they have enough uh, hand over the, the companies, like if it's a Chinese company or a Russian company, and they're like they have enough power to force the hand, um, they can cause an accident nobody would even know. Exactly. And, you know, even if someone knows, uh, they achieved their goal anyways. So would like driving a, a regular car during the era of self-driving cars be like going incognito? If it's a level zero or a level one, yes. But you're starting at level two, you're, you are already exposing yourself to those cyber attacks. Well, that's true. Uh, the physical, the physical protection. Uh, for example, uh, going back to the idea of the of the protection of the person itself, when it comes to like being locked in there, uh, I still believe there could be like a manual. Uh, you can like uh, unlatch the door in a way that it's not electronically controlled anymore. I, I still think that's a possibility. But when you mentioned Nathan, the example of taking control over your of your steering wheel for like half a second. Given enough speed, that's mo most definitely enough enough to kill, and that just makes it seem that driving a self a self driving car can be even more dangerous. But then, on the other hand, supposedly the ABS uh, brake is an electronic system that uh, helps you helps you brake the car in a particular way. It's there's some software in there somewhere, or uh, potentially some hardware that simulates that effect. Uh, technically, it's possible for someone to hijack your car. And do some fancy thing to the ABS that, in particular way, like in a couple hours from now, it will uh, react in a completely improper un un way, and it will make your car crash. So, in a sense, I, I guess at the same time, it's—I don't think it's a problem that's particularly related to self-driving cars, even level zero cars. In a sense, would ABS count as le level one? Yes, ABS is level one because level one involves uh, certain control of the uh, acceleration uh, of the vehicle. So in this case, some of the some of the control over the vehicle is given to ABS in order to stop sooner. Um, also, cruise control is considered uh, level one because uh, the car can maintain speed which otherwise you would have to do that manually paying attention to it. So that's considered level one. Then when you get to level two, you still have all of those features, but now you have adaptive uh, cruise control, which keeps the distance to the car in front of you, as opposed to just keeping uh, a certain speed. Um, and you can also have steering to keep yourself inside the lane. And that's why I was saying that level two is when the computer has complete ability to control the acceleration and uh, stoppage of the vehicle on top of the control of the steering wheel. So in that sense, I mean, you can, um, and not sure if you guys know of coma.ai, uh, it's, um, it's a company started by uh, GeoHots. He came up with this uh, Android-based device that you just put on your windscreen. And as long as you have a level two, and you connect it to the computer, you can promote this car to level three or level four even. His goal is to achieve level five, but it's debatable whether you can do that with just an Android phone. Um, but that's just to show that as, as long as you have level two capability, you can actually control the whole vehicle and you can bring it up to next levels by just doing software updates as long as you have the, the, the right sensors. So, so in a sense, the sensation that we get from this uh, is that any uh, any level of self drive driving car at all is in a sense more dangerous than a not, not uh, than a level zero, let's say. So in a way, they're 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 not safe in that regard. Yes, I would say you you increase your risk of a cyber attack, but you decrease your overall risk of getting into an accident because of distracted driving, 
because of negligence by other drivers. Someone just gets in your lane and breaks in front of you with emergency braking. You can steer away or you can just stop and you have emergency braking. So it's safer in a sense that the likelihood of you getting into a serious accident is diminished, but it exposes you to a cyber attack. So, so in a sense, you're less likely to die from any accidents or being in, in, in any sort of accident, but you are less safe in particular ways, I guess that makes sense. And that's true with our computers, with our phones, with our home assistants, Alexa, uh, Google home, Siri, um, when we add those things to our lives, we're opening up channels for attack, venues of attack. You, you're increasing your attack surface to other people that may target you. So the more email accounts, the more bank accounts, the more uh, accounts you have online, the more you're exposing yourself to some form of attack. And that's just the same you, thing. You mentioned cars. that. You mentioned that. Uh, I read something uh, earlier today that was kind of funny. It was like uh, a person was talking about how the government wants you to get vaccinated for COVID so that they can put a chip on you. And then the person shows you this on their smartphone with two microphones, two cameras. And I'm like, why did they need the chip then? You know? They already have everything. Like people are putting dots and Amazon Echoes and all that kind of stuff in their homes already. Like the government already has everything that it needs. It doesn't need a chip. Um, it's kind of like the same thing, right? Yeah, except that now, now we're exposing our vehicles uh, to a level that we're not used to. Of course, we're we're driving around with our phones in our pockets. So, in a sense, we're being tracked. Uh, you know, someone can know where we're driving to, but they lack the ability to control the vehicle. Now, level two and above, you're exposing yourself to not only being tracked, but also uh, having someone tamper with your driving and cause an accident. Yeah, like I have a, a system that I put on my car aftermarket. Um, it costs like 100 bucks here in Brazil. It's just to track my car, and I can also turn off the electrical all through my phone. This is a 10-year-old car. So we already have stuff like this. You if don't you can do it, someone it. else can too. Yeah. Uh, also, they, in a sense, uh, oh, sorry. They in had a, a problem with this as well. Like, um, really quick, a uh, couple of weeks ago, um, the cloud services that they use, I think it was Google Cloud, had an outage, like a really big outage. And all the cars, like most of the newer cars, weren't working. People were stuck in the middle of the road until the cloud came back. It was really weird. I'm sorry, Harley, go ahead. Uh, so I was thinking of this, this hypothetical scenario where let's say cars reach level five or something near, which is happening in many, many states in the US. Let's assume that all these cars are finally allowed to drive around with people on a daily basis. All right, uh, robots act differently. They, you, AI usually has its own way of doing things that to a human may look weird and, and not proper. Couldn't we assume that when you, when you get humans driving with uh, computers, even though the cars are driving properly, the very fact that computers drive in a weird way would cause this uh, difficulty of on, 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 a human from, uh, on the humans on deciding, oh, is this guy going to turn left or right? Why, why is he driving so weird? but it's just a computer thinking in a different way. Couldn't that cause accidents as well when we reach a point where half the cars are people, half the cars are self-driving? What do you guys think about this? Yeah, uh, I agree with you. I think that's a, will be a, a weird scenario. But uh, for me, uh, when it comes to the, the level five, I think the only autonomous vehicles should be in the street. Uh, we are no more, we are, we are no have more people driving around there. That's because of this kind of situation you mentioned. Um, but I don't think That's you can name. prohibit people from driving their cars. There are people that like to drive and stuff like that. So I don't think it's possible to, to 
have this kind yeah, of Yeah, I agree. That's that's why I think the this scenario you take a long time to have it. I, I think I think uh, you know just just not to, to cut you eager, but what I'm trying okay. to say is that it, you know those are uh, issues that you know we cannot really predict how they're going to come through. We're talking about so for example, there is this uh, example that I found of a of a reinforcement learning training where they had this um, spider shaped animal that was supposed to optimize its walking. And they considered, okay, uh, optimal walking would involve the least amount of uh, touches of your feet in, on the ground to get from point A to B. Guess what happened? The animal flipped on its back and started wiggling its way from point A to B. <laughs> now, this is, this is something that we, you could spot because at the end of the day, the training would say, it got from A to B and never touched the, the ground with the feet, how, how come? And then you look at the simulation and you see that the spider flipped on its back. Is that optimal? No, but the goal was misguided, right? So we're assuming that those things we're gonna remove from uh, the system before you get to, to ride the car. And the car is supposed to follow proper traffic laws. So it has certain constraints for which you know this car is supposed to stop when I step on the on the on the lane, or uh, the car cannot turn in this position. Um, so I think yes, that you know, assume that all cars are self-driving at some point, they they would figure out a weird flow of working together and being more efficient, and we may even adjust traffic laws to accommodate for that but i don't see cars flipping belly up to get uh, a more efficient uh uh transition commuting from a to b those are going to be normal ways and they're going to become normal to us and when it comes to like driving uh versus not driving um i was talking early with a, earlier with a friend and and i share his perspective which is you know, you can have lanes for self-driving cars and lanes for people to drive their cars for leisure. It's perfectly fine. You can just divide the road such that, you know, three lanes are used by self-driving vehicles and one lane to the right are for those who do not want to have a self-driving car. I think that's going to be a hard Why? sell. Because like most of the people who won't drive uh, a Tesla or a self-driving car are people who don't believe in the technology at all, at least uh, the one, the people that I know. Um, so they wouldn't accept something like this. Like they would fight, like people are fighting about masks on their face. So if you're telling them, Hey, look, you just lost your privilege to drive where everyone else drives. You have to drive on the separate lane. People are going to be like, no, no, I want to drive where everyone else is driving. Right. That's a, well, Okay, so that's that's a situation where we're assuming that most cars, I'm talking about 80%, 90% are self-driving, such that now you can take advantage of vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication, allowing speed limits to be raised, allowing vehicles to drive inches apart in a safe way without causing any accidents, and as a as a human driver you do not want to be put in this situation you're gonna fail and yes there are gonna be people who are gonna challenge that but they're gonna fail i think there are gonna be a lot of people challenging that yeah and then it, that's a learning process i mean you can challenge you're gonna fail and and um it's not gonna be pretty if you if you try to Assuming that we reach level five, and now we have those vehicles that can operate at a, a much higher level than, than humans, it, it's again, it's higher than human level. How can you drive around those vehicles? I'm, I'm sure that those vehicles are going to try to keep you safe, but you know, you're, you, it's not going to be fun. You're going to have you're, you're going to feel uncomfortable having cars driving inches apart from you at a super high velocity. And you know, accidents are bound to happen. Uh, I want to point something out. I started this talk 
saying that uh mentioning a couple of things where human that that uh areas where humans are better than computers at driving and uh, in a sense i started thinking that yeah cars these cars are not safe yet but after this talk it made me realize that they're safer but they're just not ready they're just not safer when you put them in your daily lives in cities in brazil or other places where the the, the city is not ready in those circumstances they're not safer they would they probably would not even be able to operate properly but in a more uh, lab situation in controlled scenarios they're most definitely safer that that's how i see it okay uh when you guys think we are going to have fully autonomous cars from now i think we're at least uh, a few decades away at least um from like exactly. from like minor adaption like where we can say like about 50% of the population has one. Um, total convergence, like around 80 to 90%, I think we're looking at over a century. And yeah, I don't think it's mostly a technology problem. I think it's going to be mostly cultural. Like people won't be willing to change, you know? Yeah, that's a good point because I think the, the whole market, you change when you have fill out on the scars, uh, self indirect cars. Uh, for example, I think uh, I won't buy one. I will just uh, call out an Uber, I, I don't think, of, or another platform. Because <laughs> uh, we don't need more to drive. So we just need to. I really to wish I could drive a on, Tesla. On car. I want one. Like as soon as they have them here in Brazil, mm -hmm. I'm going to buy one. So I think um, when it comes to when we're going to have self driving cars, I think pretty soon. Uh, using the metric that Nathan said, 10 years for half uh, of the vehicles to be self-driving, that's, I think, spot on. Um, it takes, on average, 20 years. I think years. it's a couple of decades. Like Oh, oh okay. Yeah. I thought you said 10 years. No, nah, like a uh, couple of decades. Like, I think three or four decades. Okay. Yeah. So, typically, it takes 20 years to renovate the whole fleet of a country or most of the fleet in a country. Uh, it's, it's very hard for you to find vehicles outside of collectors that are over 20 years old. So if you think about this, it's reasonable to assume that in 10 years, uh, assuming that self-driving cars, uh, level four, at least are right around the corner. It's safe to assume that 10 years from now, uh, a significant portion, if not half of all the, the the cars on the road, at least in the United States, are going to be level four capability. And then at least 20 years to renovate the whole fleet. And those are just, just numbers, right? I mean, if you, if, if 10 years from now, um, you figure, okay, I, I don't want to, I don't want to buy a self-driving car, no matter what, I'm a laggard. I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm not going to give up this car. 20 years from now, you might not have a chance. Next, your car breaks down, you don't have parts to keep up with it anymore, and then you're going to have to buy a car. And now all cars are level four at least. What do you do? You're going to have to buy one. So that's what typically happens uh, in these kind of situations. Or you're going to have to really just do all the maintenance in your car and you know create replacement parts. And, and that's a nightmare for most people. Uh, it's a hobby for some, but not everybody's able of uh, doing that level of maintenance in their vehicle. So I think 20 years is pretty much what we're looking at when it comes to most of the road being uh, self-driving cars, at least level four. And then, of course, I can, I can think of automakers that are never going to do self-driving. Think Ferrari, think Porsche, think Lamborghini. Uh, they might give you certain abilities, but they're never giving up their steering wheel. Never, ever. They're they're going bankrupt before that happened. So if if you're if you're a real fan and you really want one of those cars, then I, I assume that you'd be able to. But that's not going to be the mass-produced cars. That's not going to be easily available or, or easy to acquire as it would be any other uh, vehicle available that has those driving capabilities. Make sense. Forward. Oh, sorry. If I were to give, uh, if, I were to, if, I, if I were to bet, estimate how long this were to happen, as, as proposed by Igor, I'd I would go out on a leg and say, 
50 years sounds proper to me because the amount of time uh, I imagine a country like Brazil would need to readapt the cities for these cars, for the self-driving cars to be proper and safe and operate well, uh, that costs a lot of money and there will be a lot of changes that infrastructure wise and I, I, I would bet 50 years plus. What do you think, Fernando? Yeah, I agree. Uh, there are Is that on total convergence or just like partial conversion? Uh, I would say like reaching 50% plus uh, self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to agree. There are some streets that barely has one lane for two vehicles. <laughs> there are places that like there is no street at all. And here in Brazil, for example, there are places that are very messy and I can't see these cars navigating such places anytime soon. I think uh, when it, while the United States is uh, more adapted and more near the time that we will have the, this level four and, and five cars around the, around everywhere, I think Brazil would would take at least ten to twenty years to at least uh, have the proper infrastructure. And for example, let's say that I want to go to a small city and it's even harder. Maybe Sao Paulo, Rio and those kind of cities can adapt more easily. But small cities, it would be very hard to imagine. Hold on a minute. If we're talking about level five capability, we're talking about a car that's capable of at least human level performance, right? And we're not talking about infrastructure. Why do we need to upgrade infrastructure if right now we're capable of driving with the current infrastructure? Well, um, I think it's easier to to be able to drive around with the with proper signs and stuff like that. I think it's very hard, really, to to imagine a level five that would actually work here in Brazil, for example. Maybe it would work in the United States, but in other countries like India, China, Brazil, and so on, I think it, I can't imagine really, especially so what because- you're saying, So what you're saying is that um, self-driving cars can be dumber in the US and need to be smarter in Brazil. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> People here yeah. drive like crazy. The streets are uh, <laughs> really bad, so. Also, to add on to what Fernando's saying, it's very common here in Brazil for you to go to a farm or a rural uh, or area where there is no asphalt. Yeah. And yeah. you have some really difficult conditions there for a human to, to deal with. So I, I imagine that you're getting a car to reach level five to that extent, handling all kinds of situations, uh, it would be very expensive. I would assume that a, a proper infrastructure would, would be more expensive but more feasible to do. Well, so that what you just said is perfectly fine with level four, which is capable of driving on most circumstances and that, you know, you don't have back roads everywhere in the in Brazil. You have most circumstances of uh, the time that most people are driving, they're driving over asphalt, over proper signage. So level four is completely possible in Brazil without any changes in infrastructure? Or am I missing something here? Well, in particular areas, if those areas were adapted and if the, the if you take into account the fact that, as you mentioned previously, that left turns are not allowed and details like that, yeah, sure. You, car, level four cars would be able to drive around particular areas that are decently, uh, uh, has, has proper signs and, and everything like that, yeah. And that level five is a matter of training under those back roads because the the uh, sensors and everything else, they were exactly the same. It's just a software update when you get to that point. Oh. Yeah, fair enough. So again, no infrastructure upgrades required. I don't know. I, I have a hard time imagining a car rallying, go, go, pretty much driving down a dirt road And you, and you end up, uh, you know, there's um, all kinds of circumstances. I, I swear, like a lot of holes, potholes up and down, and you've got cows crossing the, the your way. 
and you've got the little bridges that they're really thin and then it's you know, made as, of wood and but like here's here's the apart. thing like here's here's a a, a, a a counter argument to that when we create this ai this level five capable ai you're not training for specific cases like that you're training to handle all kinds of situations so when it reaches something like that it'll adapt and do what it needs to do you know so it doesn't have to be trained to deal with that because it'll be trained to deal with mostly everything yeah but i think it we would need another kind of technology because deep learning right now it doesn't generalize too well for new cases like that it doesn't work like our minds that we can generalize like that so but i don't think I, I don't think it would base only on um deep learning like it would be a combination of deep learning computer vision like a whole array of technologies and i agree with you i think we still need to advance a lot before we're to that point that was an amazing discussion guys i think uh there's room for another hour at least self-driving cars are very exciting um you know, just summarize, we think it's safe um, when the technology uh, finally comes, com completely autonomous vehicles are probably gonna be as safe or safer than humans. Uh, cars do not drink and drive. Cars do not text while driving. Um, so, and they can see better than we can under most conditions. So, you know, the truth is, yes, it's going to be safer. It's going to expose us to new threats and new challenges. But when it comes to fatal accidents, the reality is that self-driving cars are going to uh, decrease those numbers. Thank you guys again. Thanks for watching. Thanks for participating. Um, I'm going to post the introduction in our blog. Um, I'm adding links to the description of this video so you guys can access our blog. And... Uh, Looking to see you guys again next Thursday at 1 p.m. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.